Hi, everybody. Um, this is Stephen Evans. Great to see you here tonight. Um, thank you for joining us in the latest of our series of Creative Conversations Digital. We're very excited tonight to have Legacy Russell in conversation with Andre Barak Jr. And um, as we get started, I'd just like to introduce myself, Stephen Evans, if I didn't say that already, uh, director of PhotoFest. And I wanna thank our major institutional and individual supporters, the Houston Endowment, the Brown Foundation Incorporated, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Texas Commission on the Arts, the City of Houston through the Houston Arts Alliance, the Philip and Edith Leonian Foundation, the Powell Foundation, the Wortham Foundation, David and Martha Moore, the WWW Foundation, the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation, Nina and Michael Zilka, the PhotoFest Board of Directors, Silver Street Studios, and generous donors to the PhotoFest Annual Fund. And in addition to the program tonight, I ask you to mark your calendars for our upcoming talk on Saturday, October 24th at 2 p.m. Central Time with Hakeem Adewami and Brenda Cherry uh, on art and activism, past, present, and future. And uh, photographer Hakeem Adewami was part of a team that profiled Brenda Cherry and other activists for a story in Texas Monthly Magazine this summer. This conversation will bring together the two voices working in disparate social and cultural realms, arts and activism, to examine the various ways in which socio-political resistance can be enacted and performed both locally and globally, from small town squares to the streets of major cities. Uh, again, that's on Saturday, October 24th at 2 p.m., and I hope you'll join us. You can find more information about this upcoming talk, our archive talks, and other programs at www.photofest.org. I'm really excited tonight to introduce our speakers. Um, Legacy Russell is a curator, writer, and artist. She is the Associate Curator of Exhibitions at the Studio Museum in Harlem. Her academic, curatorial, and creative work focuses on gender, performance, digital selfdom, internet idolatry, and new media ritual. Legacy's curated exhibitions and projects are many and include Projects 110, Michael Armitage, organized with Thelma Golden and the Studio Museum in Harlem at MoMA, Dozy Canoe Function, Chloe Bass, Wayfinding and Radical Reading Room at the Studio Museum in Harlem, all of which were presented in 2019. Between 2018 and 2019, she organized Mood, Studio Museum Artist in Residence 2018 to 2019 at MoMA PS1, Glitch at Night, and a series and a series of multimedia events exploring digital feminism and celebrating queer nightlife at ICA London in 2017. Among other institutional projects, Russell is currently working on organizing with Thelma Golden and the Studio Museum in Harlem projects, Garrett Bradley, a presentation of the artist and filmmakers multi-channel video installation, America, forthcoming at MoMA in 2020. She's also working at this Longing Vessel Studio Museum Artists in Residence 2019 to 2020, which will feature the work of E. Jane, Elliot Reed, and Nodeline Pierre to be presented at MoMA PS1 in winter 2020. Russell's written work, interviews, and essays have been published internationally. She is the recipient of the Thoma Foundation 2019 Arts Writing Award in Digital Art and a 2020 Rauschenberg Residency Fellow. Her first book, Glitch Feminism, A Manifesto, is published by Ver Verso Books this year. And you can order Legacy's book online by visiting the Reparations Club website at www.rep.club.com, I think. Is it a .com at the end? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't have that on my bio. Um, I just want to say how excited I am that we've got Legacy and Andre Brock Jr. here tonight. Um, it's uh, It's been a long time since I've been excited by reading theory and cultural criticism and um, her, her book is just fantastic. I urge you to, to order it. And as well, um, 
Andre Brock Jr. is Associate Professor of, Digital, of Black Digital T Studies at Georgia Institute of Technology in the School of Literature, Media, and Communication. He is an interdisciplinary scholar with an MA in English and Rhetoric from Carnegie Mellon University and a PhD in Library and Information Science from the University of Illinois at Ur Urbana-Champaign. His scholarship includes published articles on racial representations in video games, black women and weblogs, whiteness, blackness, and digital technoculture, as well as groundbreaking research on black Twitter. His article from the black hand side, Twitter as a cultural conversation, challenge social science and communication research to confront the ways in which the field preserved a color, quote, a colorblind perspective on online endeavors by normalizing whiteness and othering everyone else, end quote, and sparked a cultural conversation that continues as Twitter in particular continues to evolve. His most recent book, Distributed Blackness, African-American Cyber Cultures was published by NYU Press in 2020. And uh, you can order Distributed Blackness online at NYU Press by visiting www.nyupress.org. And I'm so excited to have you here too, Andre. I am gonna, uh, I've, that was a long introduction. I'm gonna turn the floor over to you both and let you get right into it. And um, thank you so much for uh, being in conversation with us tonight. Thank you so much for having us, PhotoFest and Stephen and Max for um, your generous space, uh, holding that space this evening with you is such a pleasure. And Andre, of course, I mean, to be honest, I'm fanning out. I said I wouldn't, but I am. Um, just recognizing that, you know, I'm thinking back at the times where, you know, in, I think it was in the winter before your book came out where I reached out to you and kind of um, was just so excited to learn more about your research. And it just, I can't believe that this book is real um, and just so incredible in front of us, you know, in the flesh um, and just such a pleasure to be here with you today to kind of dig in. Um, I thought that maybe a good place to start outside of just like generally nerding out, which is inevitable, um, is maybe to talk about this question of what is distributed. Um, for me, thinking about glitch um, and the way that glitch embeds itself, both as a vehicle, but as well kind of as a language of kind of um, viral position, something that um, embeds itself in many different places and spaces is in itself a distributed material. And so I wanted to maybe get a sense from you about, you know, what distributed might mean for this question of blackness. How does that operate as a technology, especially, you know, as we're kind of thinking through blackness as a lens that, you know, of course is um, expansive, right? It is something that also is like difficult to define. It is both ontological and democratic. Um, it is super sticky, but also dispersed. Can you maybe talk a little bit about, you know, this question of what it is to be distributed um, in relationship to the internet? So thank you for having me. Thank you PhotoFest for having me as well. So in distributed blackness, I wanted to talk about the capacity of the internet uh, to touch upon points uh, and connect them together in a collective, not necessarily as a community, but as a collective. Right, and so there was a there's a part early on in, in glitch feminism where you talk about discovering the capacity for self within the internet, mm. and um, the genesis of distributed blackness came to me when I left New York behind. I left the South behind, and I went to the Midwest to become a professor, and uh, at the University of Iowa. Hey, colleagues, if you're there, right? Uh, it was very difficult being that one black person. Uh, one of a few black people in the entire city, right? Mm -hmm. And so the internet provided a place where I could uh, find refuge of uh, people who look like me, of people who understood me in my wholeness, mm -hmm. as opposed to the limited ways that they could comprehend my flesh when they saw me on the street and thought I was a football player, right? Or saw me, <laughs> or saw me just in um, the university setting and assumed that it, I was either a student or an adjunct. Right. Mm -hmm. Instead, I didn't have to worry about those things on the internet because I had already assembled a universe, a network of people who could comprehend me. Right. Yeah. And so I want to flip this question back to you then. Um, does the glitch have possibilities for distribution? I mean, absolutely. I feel like the glitch is something that, um, like I said, is, is 
intended to operate as a kind of provocation, as a material that is highly distributed, as something that um, I feel like is inherently Black and inherently queer in its intersection um, with the world. Um, you know, I, I appreciate you speaking to this idea of what it, it meant to kind of come into an awareness of that um, enfleshment, right? Like the ways that we are read out in the world versus how that might operate when we're um, online and thinking through the, the fact that these spaces are operating um, in different ways to serve different forms and functions, but also as well, I mean, Andre, your work does such a um, kind of beautiful service to thinking so generously about, you know, this question of, um, the internet being a site, right? Like, you know, not perhaps singular in its destination, definitely one that is, you know, highly distributed um, with incredible um, possibility for dispersion, but also to a place that people travel to and that they are able to engage, you know, across different kind of lines of discourse, uh, different parts of their identity um, and as well, um, different types of enclosures. So, you know, for me, I think, you know, when I, I consider what the glitch can do, it operates, you know, with that thinking in mind. It allows us maybe to think about, you know, what um, kind of publics and counter publics can um, be traversed, and as well too to push that further, allow us perhaps to kind of consider what it means to have the internet as an actual space that we can find some refuge in, even despite the fact that, of course, it's an incredibly complicated and volatile space, and one, of course, that mirrors so many of the problems that are in the world. So I have a follow up, if you don't mind. Yeah. So in Distributed Blackness, in the second half of the book, I take some time to build out what I call a libidinal economy, mm -hmm. right, of Black, of Black technoculture. And by libidinal economy, for those in the audience who may not have read my work, I'm, I mean that there are beliefs and precognitions that precede us as we engage with any particular artifact or technology, right? So in the book, I ask, what does it mean to... Uh, as a black person, what beliefs about the world and yourself do you bring to any technological artifact that you have? And so when I was reading Glitch Feminism, I was particularly struck by the libidinal weight of what you're asking, right? You're, and, mm -hmm. and so I wanted to ask you to try to, to, to hopefully help walk me through what, what the glitch is and what it means from a libidinal space, not as a technical space, right? But I think what you do throughout the text is exp explain the libidinal tensions that accompany uh, this uh, this move towards a glitched entity, right? Uh, and I wanted you to talk a little bit more about what the glitch means to you above and beyond its technical capacity as a disruption in a of a modern technology or institution. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think um, the glitch is like intended to be something that is deeply somatic. Um, it's mm -hmm. something that uh, is tied to, um, and this perhaps is something we can pivot to next, but this question to of um, what it means to kind of um, non-perform or to perform differently and allow that to become something that kind of is carried with us on our bodies. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, this kind of libidinal question for me is meaningful if only because I don't see it as something that exists um, only as tied to the machine. And also, you know, okay. I guess to speak to the um, threads of sussing it out further, right? Like I think that, you know, you had kind of noted in some of your questions to me as we were just vibing this idea of um, perhaps the assumptions that are made about the machine, right? The, the machine operates in a particular way and that the body does not, right? Or vice versa. Um, and I do think that, you know, part of what the glitch or my hope is that that it does as a material is that it allows us not only to kind of further embed ourselves in ourselves, that actually that like what a glitch does and in, in the form of a kind of machinic discourse is actually it helps us to recognize our separation from the machine. And so actually that is something that is deeply libidinal and actually then, um, you know, kind of drives us further into a greater sense of consciousness um, yeah. about, you know, what we are kind of carrying within. Um, but even further too, I think, you know, if we're kind of considering what it means um, as error, as material, that actually there's something that there that you know is incredibly um, sensual and um, uh, kind of tactile to kind of think through what it means to um, engage with the language of failure um, actively as something that um, is part of this manifesto and the kind of um, you know sort of drive of what it is aiming to do. Um, so you know I, I feel like that the kind of construct of 
of Glitch um, is trying to kind of touch on those different points. It's allowing us to both like live deeper within ourselves as we currently stand and kind of come to maybe a more complex understanding of how ourselves and the machine are separate, right? And rather than like only codependent um, and perhaps as well that ourselves are spliced or split across these, you know, relationships with the machine and then what exists out in the real. Um, but then also too, my hope is that this is something that, you know, can kind of um, continue to push us further in thinking about how we perform in the world and, you know, to bring in the language of ratchet, which I think you speak of um, with such care um, in distributed blackness, right? That I, I love that this, you know, notion of, to quote um, from the book, that ratchet digital practice is an expression of joy. Um, for me, that is so monumental and exciting to think about. Um, and when I, you know, in reading, I kind of read, reread, like dog-eared all the pages, um, underscored all the things, because I feel like that the language of Ratchet does so much um, in helping me kind of think through too, you know, the ways that that glitch um, can intersect out in the world when we think about a digital discourse. Um, that, you know, actually a part of it too, and thinking about this question of desire is that actually it is establishing a different type of, of norm. Um, and allowing us to to have that be expanded. Um, so, you know, I, I guess, you know, I'm thinking of kind of the question of what it means to, to think of, for example, uh, Haraway cyborg, right, which I think is often coming into a discourse of um, kind of cyber cultures as a kind of touch point, as a, a text that people really like, you know, journey to and call on, but it's like a really problematic text when we think about what it, it, it um, uh, kind of presupposes, the assumptions of it, libidinal and otherwise, um, as tied to whose body and what body and how that exists, um, you know, out in the world and what privileges are there. So, you know, thinking of glitched and ratchet, I'm like, you know, it's kind of a, um, expansive way of, of positioning this question of the cyborg and asking about, you know, within cyber culture, is there a way too where we can kind of push ourselves further to um, not only uh, refuse performance, right, through the act of kind of embodying a certain type of failure um, as a resistance against the system, but also to maybe build new systems altogether, you know? Yes. You just knock me for a loop. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm thinking about, I love the question about, um, you know, just Andre, I guess, like thinking about Ratchet, like I, you know, would love to hear maybe you talk about this question too, um, about Ratchet as, as being something that actually brings a, um, a sense of precarity into being, right? And when we think about actually that the way that our bodies live in the world, what that looks like, um, that actually the expression of something being labeled or marked as something that um, is an error, right? That's something that actually that the system actually cannot recognize and as a result is perceived as a threat. Um, and as well, this question of ratchet, which then, you know, too, the kind of concealment of that or revelation of it um, is something that actually makes us vulnerable as black people, right? And brings mm -hmm. into the line, you know, uh, sort of really challenging questions about class and race and gender that, you know, often, um, you know, are really triggering and difficult to kind of navigate. So I would love for you maybe to talk a little about that precarity. Like, what does it do for us? You know what I mean? So um, actually somebody tweeted me today and said that uh, distributed blackness is a book meant to show how black people deal with technology from their own perspective, rather mm. than uh, trying to understand them reaching it from a from a position of resistance or oppression. And I really appreciated that. And so your marking and linking of glitch and ratchet is really uh, delightful to me because to me, the ratchet is not simply an error in deportment or an error in um, Understanding it is a very deliberate articulation of selfhood, right? Mm -hmm. Of selfhood that is not meant to be contravened by codes of what it is to be a black technical object or a black social object being bound by those structures of propriety or modernity, right? It's something in it's something that seeks to transgress it, and that that, mm -hmm. that, that makes that that makes perfect sense to me when you talk about glitch, right? As uh, a ratchet moment of being, a, a moment of excess. But it also brings me to this, this idea also, because I talk about uh, ratchetry and racism, which uh, sh should not be part of this conversation yet, but it probably will be later, right? And I talk about racism as a mode to engender reflexivity. Mm -hmm. And so I think in Glitch, you really capture something that I wish I could have caught up to and that you have, have both sought to talk about an interruption in the, uh, uh, binary structures of everyday life, 
but also a reflexivity of self, right? Mm -hmm. A way of understanding oneself based on one's own terms. And to me, that's the, the capture of reflexivity, right? And so uh, I, see, I see glitches capturing both of those, right? Uh, the ratchet for me is important too, though, because uh, to start off talking about the rat ratchet in the book, I turn to, you know, scholars like um, Farrah Jasmine Griffin, like uh, uh, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, you know, the, 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 leading scholars for respectability and their, their discussion of how in some ways the ratchet is kind of centered in uh, the, de the denigration of the woman's body, the black woman's mm -hmm. body in particular, right? Uh, and so from that particular perspective, it led me to start talking about an embodied cognition, right? And so I'm curious to, to, to again, flip this back to you. And so where does the glitch begin in the body, mm. right? Uh, and I ask that uh, both to refer to blackness, but also to the body as, as a self, right? Is, did, was the digital necessary for you to become reflexive about the body that you uh, occupied at, the first, at first, right? Uh, was the internet responsible for that glitch, right? And I don't yeah. think it was, but I no, wanted you to, say, to exactly. tell exactly. Yeah, I agree right? with that. Um, but is the internet helpful for the reflexivity around what it means to continually hold that idea in place as you navigate the world? Does that make sense? Yes, I mean, absolutely. I mean, and I will um, wholeheartedly agree. I think the internet maybe wasn't necessary in order for one to recognize oneself, like for me in terms of what that um, experience was of coming into an awareness. Uh, it was channeled through the moment in time, right? It was channel channeled through the reality of these technologies being present and it, it being a place where, as we were saying, one can journey to. Um, but of course, like it existed, you know, before the machine, right? This is something right. actually that, you know, is centered within cyber cultures because it's the thing that, you know, we're nerding out about and that we love and are curious about and confused about. Um, so I speak through that lens, but I, I you know, I do feel very strongly that this, you um, idea of, of where um, one was seeking a reflection. Like for me, that was something that is intensely personal. And I think back, you know, in terms of your book um, and thinking about the, the question of, you know, moments where the world feels hostile. And so you think about other ways where one might retreat or enclose um, or collectivize and have those things operate with different layers of privacy. And, you know, that is really what the digital and the internet, my kind of early experiences with that, you know, did, right? It allowed me to have a certain type of um, enclosure that otherwise might not be possible. And also too, I think it, it like modeled for me, you know, being able to see and thinking of this question of ratchet, right? Being able to see like, you know, ways where, um, you know, difference was not um, branded as such actually, but that actually the kind of performance of, of, uh, of a different self was something that actually was celebrated, right? And that actually could be expansive. And this is, you know, in a kind of utopic um, 1.0 version, you know, 1990s of the internet, right? And like being, in kind of naive in that sense, but you know, even so in growing into an adulthood and kind of um, engaging in the scholarship and thought around this, I think that there is still this like really deep tension between an on and offline self um, as a black person, um, you know, and as well thinking through the lens of like what the digital continues to do, you know, to bring an example from distributed blackness, you know, even just being able to go into certain group texts, right? Or being able to engage with, as you had noted, um, you know, thinking about this question of black Twitter that actually Actually, these are spaces where our identities actually may not require a certain type of translation. Um, and so, you know, that for me um, becomes the thing where uh, it necessitates the digital, actually, um, that, you know, these things actually are incredibly useful as a loop. They are, you know, actually necessary to see as, you know, your on and offline self is being continuous, but also too thinking very critically about the reality of being able to expand oneself, actually um, take a stance as being someone who is a glitch um, and or is ratchet, right? That that actually as a politic is something that becomes more possible um, and maybe more emancipatory too as we're seeing that it's possible to do and collectivize with a community right. that may not be in the room with you in that moment. And so there's this kind of bend in terms of a space and time there that feels really necessary. And that actually for me speaks to kind of this question of a black future. What does it mean to kind of build that? It really does require, you know, this a question of black time or of queer time does ask us to, to bend in half, right? To allow for things right. maybe to kind of dictate outside of the norm and to push back at how we define the temporal. Um, and so 
so, you know, this uh, notion of kind of hiding in plain sight, right, that we're, you know, existing in these, uh, you know, again, your, your words, enclaved counter publics, right, that, um, that that actually can be a site really of a kind of radical action of possibility. Um, and so, you know, I guess I'm thinking about in terms of just your um, kind of argument, right, like, that you know, for example, the black barbershop as being a physical space, that is something that, you know, a certain type of networking op operates, a certain type of algorithm even, it becomes possible or discourse. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm wondering too, you know, what it means to um, be thinking about this question about other types of, of spaces as they've traveled online. Right. Glitch, you know, and glitch feminism um, looks at queer nightlife in terms of how that has moved online, what that means and, and how mm -hmm. that has manifested the language of a kind of queer nightlife culture and club culture um, now being something that actually has existed in the digital because actually aspects of the physical space has shrunk. Um, mm -hmm. And that actually that the, you know, what that has necessitated has been quite violent. Um, thinking about, you know, the reality of what has made that possible. So I would wonder, you know, thinking about the question, for example, of black Twitter, um, you know, where that ebb and flow or where are you seeing that happening? Hmm, that's a really good question. So to answer part of the question, um, when you mentioned queer nightlife, I immediately began thinking of the ways that we've adjusted to nightlife in the pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, specifically uh, D-Nice's DJ parties or oh whatever God, your yeah. favorite DJ is. I never right? thought I'd and, be alone in my kitchen partying, like literally D-Nice has made it possible. Right. Right. People are in their kitchens and their living rooms getting drunk, you know, sipping on whatever and dancing to the Stepping music. on my own foot. It's great. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. And we're, uh, as you mentioned, you uh, shouted out Sherry Turkle's book, We're All Alone Together. Right. Yeah. And I think I think that's really fascinating. Uh, the term, the space, the safe spaces, though, and I. Um, I can't help but thinking of Lovecraft Country, which apparently is just over, which mm. I have not seen, so don't spoil it. But oh Lovecraft God. Country <laughs> draws heavily on the Green Book, right? And the mm -hmm. Green Book talks about building out, uh, the Green Book as an artifact denotes or points out on a map spaces where Black folk can come together, socialize, to rest, to gather oneself. Mm -hmm. And so I'll have to admit that I have not done the work necessary to identify those spaces for queer folk of color to congregate online to do those to to rest and rejuvenate themselves but i have seen some of it on twitter mm. right as 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 uh terrible a social space as twitter can be i think twitter and this is something sophia mentioned sophia noble mentioned earlier today uh twitter can also be a space where we rejuvenate and re uh re-energize ourselves mm -hmm. and so i i see the ways that groups of queer folk get together in twitter and they have their kiki circles as my grandmother would say y'all over there kiki and with one another right but they also have moments where they discuss deeply relevant moments of activism representation and the like and so in some ways twitter is also that space I think that the textual focus of Twitter tends to draw in a certain type of person. And so I would be curious to see if that happens also. Well, Tumblr is the ur space, right? It's where a lot of this stuff yeah. really started, but also on Instagram, right? And so I, I don't I see those as enclaved, yes, but public in a way that they had never been public before. Right. <laughs> if you can imagine, apart from the fact that trolls will try to, you know, hack your IP address or fish and get access to your spaces, these are safe spaces that are mounted by queer folk of color, that are protected by queer folk of color, and that host discourses germane specifically to the experiences of queer folk of color. And I don't think we've seen that, right? And so uh, in many ways, I can understand you making this connection because that in itself is a glitch, right? Mm -hmm. It's not the way that internet sociality was originally understood or still is understood as a province of a certain type of moneyed, uh, heterosexual, cis, uh, white man uh, in a certain urban location, right? It's, it's very different to that. And so the very presence of those spaces to me speaks to both the glitch and one of the questions I have for you, how does the glitch become sustainable? Mm -hmm. Mm. Right. How do, uh, because given that it is, as you as you speak to it uh, for your own journey, a, mo a moment of internal reflexivity and realization. Right. How do you continue? Because realization, like learning to see is one, something you do once. Right. Mm. <laughs> then mm. you start seeing and you and, and the world, the, your perception of the world changes. So once you learn to see yourself, how do you find spaces as a glitched entity? And I keep using that term and I'll tell you why in a bit. Um, as a glitch entity to, uh, to, to build spaces where folk like you can congregate and 
uh, build together, right? It's, it's a question that kind of bedeviled me all the way through the book up until a certain point when you started talking about AFK. And when you yeah. started talking about AFK, that made perfect sense, right? And so uh, the idea that we are no longer, we should never have thought about it in the first place of having a digital dual existence. Hmm. The person you were offline is the same, is a different person from who you are online. You're, the way you frame AFK, the way you bring it up as the concept of, I am just not at the computer, but I am still a whole person. This, the internet allows me to express multiplicities virtually that I not, might not necessarily be able to express offline where people can only see this embodied representation. That's a really fruitful way, I think, to begin trying to understand what the enclave can look like and can be like both online and offline. Yeah, and I mean, I think that just to parse that out a little bit because I'm getting super jazzed, um, you know, I feel like the question of sustainability when it comes to the glitch, there are a few lines there. One of them absolutely is this question of how one mobilizes away from one screen, that actually it's a, you know, it's a kind of incomplete sentence if we're assuming that a certain type of movement can exist online purely and that that actually can be resolved, right? Um, but I also do feel very strongly that there is something that is really um, kind of complex and exciting about this particular moment, because even though this particular moment has been such a heart-wrenching period for me, like, you know, and so many folks, right, as we're kind of navigating it, what it has brought to light is the fact that actually it has um, demanded of us to think about what the loop is as we come back online, right, that actually parts of our dependency on what an offline space might be as being the place where all things can be real and lived and fully realized um, has pushed us further into a different type of imagination. And so for me, the question of sustainability or how to kind of make it something that um, that is durational and kind of complex and that, um, you know, can can last and is intended to be something that is generative and grows over time as an organic material is thinking about the fact that, you know, we kind of create these delineations for ourselves and then we house ourselves within them. And that that is in itself kind of an insincere way of operating in the world. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, part of, um, you know, what I really enjoyed in thinking about the connections across these two books is thinking about this question of play and quite literally that play becomes a, a core component of what um you know, what makes uh, this both libidinal and also as well sustainable in thinking through how this can live, you know, both within our form, transform us, but then as well push us further to explore the world, to be honestly curious about what it means to step away from our screens and actually embody those things that we may have um, explored or experimented or even discussed in Enclave, in privacy, um, you know, hidden in plain sight or otherwise, having those things become possible um, as a collective and knowing that those things can be housed and cared for out in the world becomes the kind of political act. That in itself is where, you know, the kind of the, the space um, uh, becomes transformative. And, you know, thinking through too what makes um, both distributed Blackness and the question of what is distributed on the internet um, and glitch something that feels um, uniquely Black in its vernacular is this uh, focus on this language of the remix that actually, you know, that in both text there is something there that mm -hmm. feels really committed to the idea of um, what it means to kind of make one's own even despite the fact that the institutions within which we are operating within and the spaces we are um, kind of uh, engaged with are deeply flawed and actually you know to go back to the question of racist, incredibly racist, classist, ableist spaces, right? So what does it mean to remix these spaces and make them our own? Out of necessity, out of, you know, kind of a desire to abolish, out of maybe a question about, you know, how to decolonize, that those things actually um, run alongside of one another, I, you know, I feel like. And that, you know, hopefully is part of the aspiration of, of this question of distribution, but also of like dispersion too, like what it means to, um, you know, exist with in a space where uh, the kind of publics are so vastly situated, they are so cosmic um, that there is no single entry point. And you know, while that of course feels like a, a problem of mod modernity, right? It also is something that presents an opportunity because it means that there is um, you know kind of unlimited amounts of sites that one can travel to to kind of do that work collectively, and then to think through a way where that can materialize in physical space. Okay. I have a question for you. Yeah. 
I think that you did a play upon words. Um, and so I need to know what it is about feminism that you're glitching. Yeah, I mean, I have to say I take issue with the um, entry points of some of uh, feminism, of course, because of, it seems like, you know, glitch feminism speaks from a history of cyber feminism. Cyber feminism is complex if only because the folks who have, you know, often gone online in the 90s, the conversations that have kind of happened across an N. Catherine Hales or Faith Wilding, these are folks that, you know, have kind of risen to the top of these discourses. When you look up cyber feminism, um, that, that is the, the sort of dictated narrative. Um, and it's, it is incredibly first wave. It's actually kind of mm -hmm. devastating, although, you know, not surprising in many ways that, um, you know, we have replicated some of the same chapters of feminism as they have enacted themselves away from our screens on the internet. Um, and we thought that we were doing something different. That's so wild to me. And when we look at these histories, especially, you know, when I speak of it through the lens of a kind of art history, um, it is complicated because art history sees cyber feminism, you know, as this kind of weird renegade, like only within the last five or 10 years, I think, has it kind of been ex welcomed more into kind of a mainstream discourse. I'm thinking of like the fact that like Lynn Hirschman Leeson, who's like, you know, incredible artist, but, you know, has been working for, you know, 40, 50 years of time, this is an individual who's like only now about to kind of have, you know, her great show coming up at New Museum um, in the spring. So it's like these things, like the arc of this has been this really long arc of kind of um, engagement and, and um, uh, kind of participation within the kind of uh, discussions of um, art history and visual culture as it kind of speaks to um, cyber culture as, as a canon. And as a canon that actually is one that, you know, is to be built and interrogated and actually at points maybe to be refused because I think the, the, the whole premise of a canon is problematic. Um, but I, you know, I, I take issue with that this this idea of cyber feminism and that really is what um you know the feminism is within glitch feminism it's thinking about um you know within a wider discourse why is it that we replicated these exact um problems of art history and why is it that we are still mad at our history for those things but actually have allowed for um you know, net art, digital art, um, sort of digital practice at points to get a free pass to engage with the same and enact the same types of supremacies um, that we have seen um, within these other forms of creative expression. I just, you know, that for me is the flaw. And so, you know, when I think about ways where, you know, feminism can be done differently, I also feel, you know, at points frustrated because it does obviously operate in a strange way um, through the lens of a kind of permission. Um, and it, it requires, you know, a certain kind of conversation about uh, ways where things can be granted rather than things can be taken. And I, I do think that so much of um, a discourse, especially when we're thinking about um, questions of cyber culture, um, is like these questions of permissions. What does it mean um, to engage with, um, like to bring up call out culture, right? To engage with moments where um, we are asking permission of systems to give us more room, to recognize that actually we have been um, disturbed, to acknowledge their own supremacy. And in reality, actually, that maybe those conversations can be possible without um, some kind of other uh, sort of interruption or intervention. And, you know, that that is the thing that, you know, that, that feminism fails at. Um, you know, it is the thing that, you know, feels um, consistently uh, um, kind of opaque and unresolved and as well, um, you know, assumes a lot in terms of what it means to kind of have a certain level of unity across womanhood. The amount of panels I think that I, you know, I've been invited to where I'm, I'm sitting at a panel, I look to my left and right and it's, you know, all straight cisgendered white women who are talking about cyber feminism, right? Amazing human beings, right? More power to you, but it's also deeply problematic because it speaks to the fact that, you know, what we are doing is asking um, of, the, of this kind of canon to break itself to, you know, when we think about this question of reflexivity, that is problematic, right? Who is writing this history and who's doing that work becomes um, really necessary, which is the reason why, you know, I love when you brought up, um, you know, Keith Obidake um, as somebody who's done really important scholarship around this. But I'm also thinking of, you know, folks like Manuel Arto Abreu, right? Or Arya Dean, who are thinking very actively about what it means to do that work for ourselves um, and to kind of do that witnessing, right? In terms of being in a moment of culture and culture that is not counterculture, right? It has existed 
in right. hidden in plain sight all along. And oh, how does God. that, um, you know, how does that take material form? So this book, like your amazing book, I think does that because it shows us that it's, it's Stop. here, you know, it's mm -hmm. not been this like new revelation, right? It's like, we've been in it and standing in it. Um, and as well that these technologies as they exist, like, you know, have actually benefited deeply from our innovating them. And I think that is the part that is, you know, for me, um, that's the wound, right? That maybe needs to be resolved or resolved stitched. differently or yes. redressed. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sketched. Exactly. Um, but I would love to hear, like, you know, I'm talking, I, like, when you started talking about culture in the book, my heart started pounding because I was like, this is such a hot topic. People get mm -hmm. shook about call out culture. And, you know, even, um, the kind of provocation of it, what it like intends to do to 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 um, note that a texture of it actually is something that um, has been marked as transgressive simply because of the form that it has taken, which borrows from a black form. That is something that I think is like a really um, hard and difficult thing to kind of think about, like to, you know, to wrap one's head around, most particularly because the way that it has been weaponized, I think, you know, within a kind of mainstream culture um, against black women, um, but against, you know, black people more broadly against as well, you know, queer people um, is something that we're seeing in lots of different ways that actually call out culture now is pejorative. Um, when, you know, perhaps it is the thing that is allowing us to actually claim for ourselves, right? I don't know, what do you think? So I've, I'm comfortable in arguing that the first step in any activism is information. Mm -hmm. And what call out culture does is it demands a recognition that something has happened that was not kosher, to, right. use, a, to use a terrible word, right? That was not proper, that was not moral, that was not correct, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I'm comfortable also saying about whiteness is that whiteness does not like to be seen or questioned. So if you think right. about Jim Crow, Jim Crow quotes where black people were forbidden to make eye contact with white people because that was assumed to be a transgressive moment. Hmm. In a similar way, cancel culture and call out culture are doing the same thing. They're making direct contact as if we are peers because we are, as if we are equals because we are, as if we're both human and saying what you did was wrong. And right. so it, it achieves such a disproportionate reaction because of Charles Mills, uh, the, the phrase he, he used that I love, the epistemology of ignorance that white people allow themselves to remain ignorant of the excesses they perpetrated against each uh, against people of color and people not like them, right? As a way of maintaining their version of racial innocence, right? And so call out culture doesn't allow that to happen. It's very much a direct, who are you, right? And why do you think you could do this to me? And that that just triggers uh, a disproportionate response every time uh, to, the, to the point where conservatives have now marshaled call out culture as this thing that the left does right? Yeah. That is so dangerous to American society. And like, it, yeah, it's dangerous if you say, I'm going to call you out for, you know, saying you're a family first person, but you pay for abortions for your three mistresses. That's mm -hmm. something you need to be mm -hmm. called out for, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the, I, I want to ask you one more thing, because you had such a brilliant answer to my previous question, right? Uh, and this is, uh, this probably will require also a long answer. So go ahead and take a sip of water, right? Um, I'm here for but it. I want, I want to be clear on, uh, so let me, let me preface it like this. So blackness is the current lifting up this theoretical enterprise of glitch feminism, mm. right? It's there. It's not always um, in your face, but it's something that you refer to again and again as foundational to the ways in which you think through this particular concept. So I want you to take a moment and talk about how you see the glitch as relating to blackness, not as a pathological moment or as an mm -hmm, error, mm -hmm. but in terms of its jouissance, right? In terms of its excess of life. Can you do that for me? Yeah, I can. I mean, here's the thing, actually, I maybe want to push back on that because I actually don't think that error, I think error is pathologized, but it's not a pathology. Mm -hmm. And so I, I want to contest that a little bit because I do feel like that, um, the idea of what it means to exist in a space that actually does not want to even see us alive. Right. That, that is something that is um, important to recognize and that actually it is useful to not see that as a pathology, but rather as a condition under which we are living and mm -hmm. trying to survive and, you know, innovate and, you know, sort of manifest in different ways. So um, for me, I think, you know, the, the question of a way where it can be ecstatic, right? That this this idea of um, a kind of jouissance that like, 
can be something that um, is generative and um, allows for uh, uh, light, you know, um, mm -hmm. is really important to me because, you know, it seems like that if we're kind of talking about systems and systems that I think often too, we're seeing through the lens, um, as I said, right, that are kind of, um, Sort of algorithms of oppression to borrow a term, right? Um, that within that too, I think that the challenge has been um, that living within this, we often do see ourselves through um, a supremacist lens, that sometimes the discourse and dialogue that exists within blackness is being carved out of an, uh, a discourse about whiteness. And that for me is the thing that I think um, uh, I, I struggle with in trying to navigate maybe a better position in thinking through what it means actually to not speak from a lack, right? That actually it is like incredible and decadent um, to be um, existing in a space where we are fully comfortable um, both being uh, self-defined, self-determined, um, and as well bearing witness to one another, right? Not necessarily having that witness taking place through a lens of whiteness. And I appreciate when you noted um, talking about this question of like whiteness kind of almost being noxious, right? That part of the thing that um, it exists as, as a kind of complex construct is that it is offensive when it is named. Um, and you know that it is intended to exist as something that is not seen. Um, but the thing that I think that, um, you know, is complicated about uh, a conversation about um, a kind of whiteness is thinking through the notion that actually, you know, uh, the black spaces that are existing as, you know, enclosures as different publics, um, both, you know, within the digital and beyond it um, are ones that are are built to dazzle in many ways, right? And there is something there that is driven by a kind of ecstatic nature that we do for ourselves, that we are kind of affirming for one another and, and that that you know, becomes something that is kind of built into the vernacular of how we are kind of rethinking and the thought work that we bring into the world. So you know, that is the thing that I think um, maybe um, is, the, is the other read, right? Um, and is the thing that I think, you know, feels maybe um, most generative to me when I think about the glitch, that it is a proud space to speak from, um, simply because of the fact that the, the um, question of assimilating into a space that is violent and that asks of us to actually um, render ourselves invisible um, and or shrink ourselves to be smaller and or um, allow theft of our ideas to become normal, um, that those things um, and violence to our bodies, right, actually to become something that that is um, unsurprising, uncomplicated and unquestioned, that like that's the problem. That's the thing that actually, um, you know, requires um, you know, the correction. And so I'm not interested, I guess, you know, when we think about the text, um, having the text exist as something that um, would allow itself to be, uh, to make that standard. Um, I don't want it to fit. And actually, I don't, you know, I think it's useful too, when we think about this question of distributed blackness, um, you know, I'm not interested in, in having it be inoffensive. Um, and yeah, I think that, you know, the text itself, like, does that work? But, you know, the, I appreciate, you know, when we kind of think about, um, you know, the work of distributed Blackness, that that question of what it means to um, push back at this language of being inoffensive or the ask of it um, is something that is really important to keep centering. Like, why why do that, right? Um, one weird example, actually, Andre, that comes to mind that I, I kind of, I both, both loathed and really appreciated was, you know, thinking about how LinkedIn has become this interesting um, place for certain types of resistance and refusal. Mm -hmm. um, and that actually, you know, while LinkedIn makes me want to puke on myself, it also, on the other hand, is like a really important place to intervene, given that so much of what is respectable and the language of respectability politics, as it is kind of, um, you know, sort of threaded through our professional selves, our day-to-day -day interactions, as it speaks from a place of, of lack rather than a, a kind of generative whole um, that like LinkedIn embodies that and, and like speaks to a way where that can be made into physical form. Um, and so I've been like kind of loving these moments where people have kind of let a different self be in that space, yes. which yes. really offends yeah. its sensibility. Right. right. Um, and those are the things that actually, you know, at a kind of, you know, um, 
uh, micro and yes, macro that ratchet have a moment. resonance. Yeah. Yeah, there is yeah. that ratchet there. And that actually feels like something that, you know, is meaningful to think of, you know, to bring back this question of jouissance, like, you know, how do you um, uh, stay expansive and allow those things to be spaces that are highly unsafe and volatile for us, um, you know, to become spaces that actually we can uh, disrupt and if not only disrupt, but fully occupy and in occupying them, make them known for being fraudulent. I love that. I love that a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I want to talk about, you know, because I'm, I'm thinking about um, the question of innovation. And I wanted to go back to your book because I just, you know, there is this um, area where you cite um, Madam C.J. Walker, Grandmaster Flash, you've mm -hmm. got like, uh, Granville Woods, Mildred Kenner in there, like so many amazing human beings. And you cite them as kind of like almost the original technologists. Um, and I loved that. And it was something that came, um, you know, towards the end of your book, um, no spoiler alerts, but you know, it, it came, you know, after some time, right, of you right. talking about technology as we're seeing it as, as really hewn to the machine. But then, you know, to step away from that and to have the conversation exist um, in a place that actually, you know, may predate the machine um, as we are knowing it now, right, or may help us define the machine differently, um, and as well maybe help us think through the language of the machine. Like when we're thinking of like Silicon Valley, right? It's like all these white dudes who are like in garages having genius ideas, right? Which replicates the canon of art history where it's like white dude in a studio having ideas, right? Or white dude wandering Paris street with ideas uh, <laughs> that actually, you know, just like insert here, like these different right. like archetypes of what it is to be genius, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that the thing that you do so generously and so precisely in terms of pointing this out is thinking about the, the actual shape of genius is not a contour when blackness is present. It is like not something that um, exists as a shell, right? But I think too that the lack of awareness of that within a kind of broader technoculture discourse is one that is really troubling. Um, so I guess I wanted to get a kind of a sense from you about this question of what it means to create a black canon, right? Because like canons are problematic, yes, but also I think bringing these folks into the fore and being able to talk about them as being kind of the like the four mothers and fathers um, that allow for us to really truly innovate as a technology feels really essential. Agreed. I mean, I think of it in some ways, I didn't mean to build a canon. Uh, I was thinking about it in terms of hidden figures, right? Or hidden fences, depending on what you want to call it. Yeah. Uh, and so, <laughs> so just making visible that which had been toiling in the background or not even the background, toiling in plain sight the whole time, like you said, hidden in plain sight and doing these fantastic things that have rendered our everyday so much more easy, so easier to navigate yet are unrecognized because we, int we instead want to focus on the superstar auteur who just so mm -hmm. always happens to be a certain type of person, right? And so uh, I wanted to bring up uh, Kashawn Thompson and her articulation of black girl magic. Right. Mm -hmm. And the idea that you can make a way out of the everyday simply by doing things in your kitchen and in, in your living room on your stoop, just doing things that make uh, a moment, a post present moment. Right. Where you're preparing for the future, but you haven't left the everyday. Right. And make it a moment of joy or a moment of, of uh, innovation or a moment of invention, which is where I tend to stick with. Right. And, and to me, those things are super important. It's not necessarily that I wanted to build a canon. I just wanted people to recognize that there are folk out there who are capable of doing the thing uh, and for black folk to realize that there are folk like them who have done the thing and will continue to do it even mm -hmm. if the spotlight is not on them so mm -hmm. i don't know if that i that absolutely answers love the that. question no i love it I, and i i think um you know the the conversation about black girl magic or black boy joy actually kind of blew my mind because i've always been and i don't know why this is a little shady about those hashtags, if only because I was <laughs> concerned about the weight of them, right? right. Like I was like, we're, I, if something about it, I've always in the back of my mind just like worried about what what the um, the sort of um, density of that is and how that maybe could or could not set up certain expectations of excellence that like mm -hmm. those things, you know, are, are challenging. And I just loved your read on it because it, it really did expand for me my understanding too of thinking about, again, um, 
hashtag as a, a site like that, you know, that when we're thinking about Twitter, right, that actually it is less about actually establishing a certain type of expectation about how to perform, but rather, as you said, allowing the ordinary to become extraordinary. Um, and that that actually ah, too, I like the way is you our that. right. Thank you. No, I, I think that's our right. And it's like that, that speaks as well to this question of death decadence because you know I, I feel like that that as a as a privilege and a joy right is something that um, is really meaningful to kind of um, embody and to kind of think through um, a way of, of, of uh, sort of manifesting in our everyday for sure. I have a million more questions but I think Stephen wants to talk. I to know us now. Stephen's got a <laughs> <laughs> Well it's um, we're hitting the top of the hour and um, I'm just I, I've been so fascinated by the entire talk i think you're both geniuses and um you know i i can't thank you enough for spending the last hour with us in the audience and um talking through your both of your books which um i hope that people will get um you know it's been uh it's it's been an amazing talk and i i have questions too i have questions about queerness's place in all of this too but i think yes. that's for i think perhaps that's for another time um <laughs> <laughs> I, well, i'm up for it um and i and i'm sure our audience is too um i want to remind people that you can order legacy's book online by visiting the reparations club website at www.rep.club and you can order Andre Brock's Distributed Blackness um, online at NYU Press by visiting www.nyupress.org. Um, and, uh, you know, worthwhile investments, uh, definitely. Um, uh, and I also want to remind the audience that our next talk is Saturday, October 24th, <laughs> 2 p.m., Hakeem Adewami with Brenda Cherry art and activism, past, present, and future. And I just want to thank you both again. Uh, Legacy Russell, Andre Brock Jr. Thank fantastic you for this. talk. Legacy, you're amazing. amazing. This has been dope. <laughs> Andre, I, I have to say, we're obviously going to have to keep talking, both on Twitter, as we always do. You know, I All see right. you. But I, you know, it is an honor and a joy. Like, I have, I waited for this book to come out into the world. When it arrived, I was like, in there like swimwear. So I am so just like blessed right now to have it. And like, look at all my little, little dog ear <laughs> corners. You have to know people are just like, I just this is the moment. So, you know, it's such a pleasure. I mean, Thank you, PhotoFest. That can you both be coming from you. <laughs> can you both tell us your, uh, your, your Twitter handles so people can follow you if they're not already? I don't have a Twitter. <laughs> okay, well, I'm not gonna blow that. Okay. Um, sure. Mine can, be found, mine can be found. Um, pretty easy. Easy. Legacy Russell. Um, a long journey from my first handle ever on the internet, which was Love Punk Twelve, as those who've read the book now know. Uh, um, I love. But but and Andre, my, you've got a good Twitter handle. Yeah, D O C D R E. So Doc Dre which initially led to lots of uh, rappers dropping demo tapes in my DMs, but now that's <laughs> past the wayside. <laughs> okay. well, well, thank you thank, all. Thank you both again. Um, have a great night. And, um, you know, uh, this will be archived. So uh, in, into the future too. And uh, hope to see you talk again soon. Oh, I'm and definitely is, gonna make my is, students this watch this. Blackness. This is the glitch. This is the glitch. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very thank much, Stephen. Thanks a lot. Bye. Good night. Mm -hmm. Good night.